two, one, we're live now. Thanks everyone for coming to our SPAC for our most newest AMA with Ken Insurance and uh, Sean Harper and Matt Higgins. Uh, hello, how are you guys doing? Thank you for joining us. Doing great. Good. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Yeah, so we're really excited to have you guys. You know, we've been uh, the most past two or three uh, groups that we brought up brought to here to our SPACs were about insure tech and and it's actually really exciting stuff to hear about you know and how how the industry is changing so tell us about yourself Sean like how, what brought what like a little bit about your background who you are yeah uh, I've been doing this fintech stuff for a long time now and you know gr growing up I was interested in two super nerdy things I was interested in computers and I was interested in like the financial system. So I'm like coding and reading like Milton Friedman books and stuff. And I, uh, that just sort of, you know, I actually, my first business was an e-commerce company and we got just really taken advantage of by our payment processor. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to start a payment processor, not knowing anything at all about it. Mm -hmm. And so I did that and that was a good business and I sold it. Uh, and I worked at the acquirer for a little while. And then my co-founder Lucas and I were sort of looking around. We're like, cool. We're done with our earnout. What are we going to do next? And we were just looking for another financial product. And I love fixing finance because if you look at the center of a bank or insurance company or whatever, they're all in, they're all software companies in disguise that aren't that good at software. And they're also like a huge part of our lives. They're a huge amount of money. They're sort of like when they run poorly, they're a tax on everybody basically. And so I just love fixing them. <laughs> so, oh, so five cool. years ago, we looked around and we, we were like, well, home insurance looks, we, we looked at everything. We did the whole like management consultant thing, like looked at all the different lines of financial services and figured out which ones were the most broken. And home insurance is super broken, especially for people who live in areas where there's more weather volatility, which unfortunately is more and more of the world uh, as we're seeing. Like then let's just look at the news headlines for the last two weeks. And those customers in particular are very poorly served by their insurance companies. Uh, the expense ratios of insurance are really high and they haven't budged as the price of every other financial product keeps going down. Uh, the cost of insurance is going up and the overhead associated with that is going up. It's not, so it's, it's not an efficient experience. It's not a good experience. When you go to get insurance, it's a pain in the butt. You have to fill out a lot of forms. You have to talk to a guy more than you probably want to. You can't just do it like, like signing up for a credit card or buying something online. You should be able to. And then the industry also is not taking advantage of a lot of this data. And I just love getting into the data stuff because there's so much data out there about homes and weather and- Sorry guys. All these. <laughs> we got a guest, nice. And, uh, and they're not taking advantage of it. Um, and so, so that's, that's what gets me fired up. And, uh, you know, this, this is a really fun business, actually, you know, our, our customers are actually, you know, super, super happy that they can get insurance and at a, you know, good price and, and with a lot of convenience with a good customer service. Uh, it's cool. No, that's awesome. You know, technology has changed a lot of stuff, you know, and specifically, you know, software and then specifically, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, machine learning and, you know, artificial intelligence, whatever we have it, whatever iteration of what we have it now is really changing a lot of industries. And that's what I'm beginning to appreciate with these, with these AMAs. So that's awesome. How about you, Matt? What brought you into this background? Tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Okay. Um, I'm from New York, uh, born in uh, Queens. Uh, I'm an operator in my DNA. I've, uh, uh, managed to be fortunate to be involved in a number of different careers. My early days was actually in uh, government, and I ended up uh, helping to oversee the rebuilding of the World Trade Center site. I was a chief operating officer of the agency that was created in the aftermath of the attacks to help rebuild New York City. So I tend to gravitate towards hard things and complicated things and, uh, you know, very big projects. And from there, I transitioned to sports. I ended up uh, becoming the executive vice president of the New York Jets. And overseeing the business operations of the team, complicated, you know, business. And uh, that's where I met Gary Vaynerchuk and became, uh, basically became family with Gary. And then I partnered up with Stephen Ross uh, at the end of that eight-year run and created um, a, a venture firm hybrid incubator, the goal of which was to back amazing founders who are looking to disrupt industries, some case incubating from scratch or a founder at an inflection point who needed a boost to go the rest of the way. 
so I spent the last, I don't know, almost nine years now, uh, you know, backing businesses like Resi uh, was my partner, Ben Leventhal. We created a competitor to OpenTable, which we exited to Amex. I'm partners with David Chang. Those out there might know Dave uh, and Momofuku and Christina Tosa and Milk Bar. So I just love playing uh, a supporting role in the founder journey. I understand what it's, you know, I'm not a, I'm not, I think I'd say I'm an operator first, investor second. So when I see a problem on an Excel sheet, I don't sort of say like, what do we do now? You know, I get my hands dirty and I always like to say, I take custody of problems, not credit. Uh, so I like to get involved in, um, in particular, digital is my passion. I teach a course at Harvard Business School, co-teach called Moving Beyond Direct-to-Consumer, where I have the benefit of seeing amazing DTCs uh, across the country. Uh, some of them I invested in with my partner, Jesse Darris, and I teach about them. And that was the genesis of the SPAC, uh, this great digital pivot that took place as a result of the pandemic. I stole that from my co-star, Kevin O'Leary, uh, but this great digital pivot where we compressed you know, years and years of e-commerce adoption into 18 months was going to spawn a, non a number of incredible great businesses or accelerate them. And so I decided to form this SPAC of fellow operators. We have about 10 founders in our team at OCA with the goal of identifying a digitally fueled business that was disrupting a change resistant industry. And that's how I found, you know, uh, Ken. And I couldn't think of a, something that more aptly fits that definition than insurance, which has been really slow to adopt and the work mm. that he's doing in homeowners. Mm. That's awesome. Tell me a little bit more about the Harvard program. Is that how you discovered uh, Sean? Like, where, where did you guys actually meet? And a little bit more about the Harvard program. Yeah, so the, um, so the Harvard program, uh, I've always wanted to teach. And I approached Harvard about putting together a course, which we worked on for almost a year. And uh, the, the, the premise was, in all my investing, I kept encountering founders who had spent a ton of money to get an MBA. I went to law school. I don't have an MBA. So this was probably born out of naivete. But I was like, wait, if you spend a quarter of a million dollars on a degree, shouldn't you know when is the right time to go on Amazon? I kept meeting founders with these fundamental questions. And I was like, well, what if we could create a program that's like Apex Technical School meets like Harvard, where you actually are you know, providing real world, real time information that helps founders who are looking to either invest or create a business or even investors. And so we put together this course where we bring together the best and brightest minds and direct to consumer. The premise of it to a large extent is that you know, eventually you obviously have to expand your channels to be effective. A lot of times with direct to consumer, you, it's a way for an upstart to disrupt an industry and sort of wedge their way in. But let's an example of like consumer product goods. You launch as DTC, but eventually you find yourself back in the aisles of Whole Foods, right? So that's the premise of the course is deconstructing the omni-channel journey. Uh, but what's interesting about Kin, what I love about what Sean has done, if insurance could have been sold direct to consumer 50 years ago, that's how it would have been done. This is a virtual product. It's the equivalent of walking into like a strip mall to buy an NFT, not to Gary and all, all those people out there who are a part of uh, his group, but it doesn't make any sense, And but it couldn't be done. And, and what I love about what Sean is doing, and I always say this, complexity can become its own moat. It's really hard to figure out how to underwrite a home and Sean has figured it out. So I didn't actually meet him through Harvard. I met him because he was on our radar uh, with my team along with a number of other great businesses. Okay, that is awesome. Thanks for sharing that, Matt. Really appreciate Thank it. You. Sean, you know, I went through your video, like the advert on the website, I kind of got a, like, I didn't know this before, you know, the number of states you operate in, what are the states you currently operate in? What's your thinking on why these particular states and where are you guys going to be heading in the future? Yeah, so we're, we're only live in three states, believe it or not, uh, Florida, Louisiana, and California. Now, those three states are huge, right? This is actually $20 billion. The whole homeowner's market is a little bit more than $100 billion. So those states are 20, 20 billion. And we really like to focus on states where the state is large uh, because there's an overhead to go into each of these. Insurance is regulated on a state-by-state -state basis. So there's an overhead to going into a new state. So you want a large state. We like states also where the average policy size is large because I'd much rather, it's just a better business to be selling a $2,000 policy in Florida versus a $500 policy in Oregon. And we also like states where um, there's been some type of dislocation and where there's a real need for insurance. So where I live in Illinois, actually the insurance market functions very well. Uh, there haven't been a big increase in natural disasters. The insurance is plentiful. It's people have a lot of choices. If you go to Louisiana, totally different story. 
if you go to California, you know, especially outside of the cities, totally different story. You go to Florida, totally different story. Insurance is an even more important part of people's lives there. And it's also, it's working worse. And so, you know, we've been really focused on these, on the states that meet those three criteria. There are a lot of states that meet those criteria. Uh, it's about, it's a little bit less than half of the market. So I'd say of the, a little bit more than hundred billion, about half of that, about 40 billion of that are in these sort of like dislocated areas. And that's also, those are also areas where our data advantage is exceptionally useful because we're so good at understanding the physical properties of the home in an automated way. And that's really what you're using when you're underwriting pricing. The difference in the slope of your roof makes a huge difference in Florida where the wind gets super gusty versus in Wisconsin, it doesn't matter. You could just sort of guess at it. And that's sort of what the insurance industry has been doing for, for so long. And so we like those states. Um, the other factor that's at play is you actually um, need to get regulatory approval to go into all these other states. And you, um, it takes time to do that. And so one thing that we're really excited about when we announced this last week was we're actually acquiring this sort of dormant set of insurance licenses that will help us get into a lot more states a lot faster than we otherwise would have. Uh, so we, we will be launching more states, um, but we're gonna be pretty systematic about it. You're not gonna see us in 40 states tomorrow, even though we have the licenses for it. Um, and we're gonna be focusing on those sort of more coastal or the Western states that are more fire exposed because that's where the need is the greatest. Okay, I have a two part reply to your answer, which was quite extensive. Number one, so from the video, it looked like you'll be focusing on limited number of large states where your business plan and your algorithm can be leveraged and maximized. Is, is, is that is that yes? Is that you put that very well, yeah. And then the, and then the second part is how do you, how do you even benefit from a state where there's more disasters? If I was in risk mitigation, risk minimization, I would stay away from some a state like that. Well, you know, it, that's, that's what it seems like at first, but the reality is that what you're really trying to do in insurance is um, charge the appropriate price and provide the appropriate coverages for the risk. Mm -hmm. So you're really not trying to avoid risk. You're trying to accurately manage and price risk. And so in some of the areas where you would think it's the easiest to make money, you know, the low risk areas, it's actually really hard to make money because how do you get an advantage there? And the underwriting is so simple and so commoditized that it's actually much harder to, to build a good business there. And so, you know, and, and then the other part of it is just like, as an entrepreneur, I don't get any pleasure. I mean, I get well, a little bit, I get a lot less pleasure out of providing sort of a me too product in a market where people don't really care that much about it. What really fires me up is figuring out a new way to do something to provide a product that people really, really need. That's 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 off that's that's awesome. Thank you. And sorry, my cat is just, just stuck into the office. He's somewhere. interested. He wants to hear about insurance. Uh, he wants to learn a little bit about no, who doesn't, Sean. <laughs> so, so the other question I want to ask is for Matt. Matt, what does Omnichannel Acquisition Corp bring to the table for Ken and as they grow? Well, a, you know, one of the things I love about Sean, and it does speak to the complexity of what they've built. He spent the last several years with his co-founder, Lucas, Angel, the entire team, incredible people, building a really complicated product and testing it through simulations and obviously, you know, real live exposure, but they've kept their head down. They've done that. And I would say, and he would, Sean would, you know, acknowledge this, that they haven't maximized brand, right? They've created a performance marketing machine to enable them to convert and acquire customers at a very high uh, uh, LTV to CAC ratio, which when you go into the investor presentation, you could read more about it, but, you know, really phenomenal unit economics, but at the same time, there's an opportunity to really build a brand. And I think that's where we come in. Uh, my partner is Gary Vaynerchuk. Together we own VaynerMedia. We've got some great people on our team of board advisors, Christina Tosi, Bobby Brown, a lot of people who know what it takes to build an enduring brand. And I think that's where there's a ton of, you know, upside with Kin. Uh, I'm also the vice chair of the Miami Dolphins with my partner. I have a lot of deep relationships uh, and ties to the Florida market. So I've been able to help advise Sean and the team about how do we go deeper? How do we make sure that anyone in Florida, when they're thinking about homeowners insurance, they think about Ken? Because Florida is in a crisis right now. 
Uh, if you Google right now, you know, every single day there's another article about insurance carriers simply leaving the marketplace. And that's not a viable response to climate change. Like maybe today that might work as a mitigation strategy, but 10 years from now, climate change is everywhere. And so we need to stay, we need to create hardened societies, hardened homes. And Florida is obviously an important place to do that. So uh, the role that we're going to be playing, many roles, with Sean, I feel like I'm the first text in the morning, the last thing text to tuck them into bed. It's like, we're going to work really hard on the Florida market and how to make sure that Ken is top of mind. That's awesome. I know Florida really well. Like a lot of people in the, in the Midwest, we go to the Gulf Coast for winter vacation. You know, we go to St. Pete and Clearwater Beach and so forth. And I can clearly tell, you know, watching for the past 10 years like things are changing for sure i'm not obviously in you know so intimate and aware about the insurance industry but as a scientist from the perspective of climate change i can see how those changes are happening and how companies be, could be exiting the market so that's a good place to build a business for sure another question matt you know uh, what are the top three challenges that you see a new public company that they typically face you know, is it scaling? Is it growth? Is it, you know, uh, management of cash? What do you see as the three top problems? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, in no particular order, I would say, and again, in my time on Shark Tank, it's the same message we always uh, give to an entrepreneur, know your numbers, right? So when you're transitioning from a private company to a public company, you know, if there is a miss as a private company and you don't have a full handle, you know, maybe the VCs will be forgiving. The market is much less forgiving. So number one, you have to transition, obviously, to make sure not only do you have a complete handle on your business, but you're able to go ahead and forecast to a reasonable degree, right? So that's, I would say, is number one. Number two, uh, you need a different level of infrastructure in order to be a public company, obviously much more regulated, different obligations. And so transitioning from private to public, transitioning from bootstrapped to well-funded is a kind of an interesting transition. We don't talk a ton a lot. I see that's probably one of the number one issues I work with founders about like, that's great, but what got you here is not what's gonna get you there. So it's, you know, it's terrific. You know, you got here with very little. Uh, Ken is a perfect example of being incredibly capital efficient to where they got here relative to their peer group. But then at the same time, you now need to transition to investing in infrastructure. Uh, three, I would say, you need to execute on becoming a public company, but at the same time can't lose sight of the fact you have to run a business. So it is very all consuming. It's very stressful. Uh, Sean, you want a cool character like Sean to be running an insurance company, but you know, remarkably able to you know, navigate the stress that goes with it. But of course it's a lot of pressure. So stay focused on your business. And I would say four, you have to be able to communicate your vision and story, right? You can't hope and expect that the market is just going to discover that you're an incredible company. You have to make sure that you're out there and you're comfortable communicating to shareholders and stakeholders and employees. So there's a new level of expectation around communication about communicating your vision that maybe you didn't have to do when you were a private company. So those are my four, uh, no particular order. Okay. One of those four that I'm really interested in knowing more is uh, the infrastructure. Can you elaborate more on that? You know, what do you mean by building up on your infrastructure? I, I'd say the number one areas where companies are transitioning from you know, private to public, obviously is finance function. It's investor relations function to be able to communicate with the street. It's the legal function. So you can handle regulatory and compliance, just a lot of functions that wouldn't necessarily exist in a private company. And so you wanna make sure that whoever you're partnering with, whether it's a, you know, a SPAC or a bank, that you have somebody who could help mentor and guide that. When I put together the team of Omni, I want to make sure that I had individuals who had public company operating experience. So I recruited Al Carey, former CEO of Pepsi North America. He's an advisor on my team. And I recruited uh, Delphi Bernard, who's former head of uh, finance at, uh, at, at, uh, at Uber, who had that sort of practical finance experience. And we have a lot of other individuals that we task, but you wanna make sure you have people you can rely on who can help mentor you as you transition from you know, private to public. No, that's fair. You know, uh, PR and public relations is something that's sometimes underrated, you know, uh, especially with 300 SPACs right now and so many new companies going public. Turning to Sean, can you tell me a little bit more about the four proprietary tools to automate, predict, analyze your data? You know, the ones mentioned on your site, Maestro, Kinbot, Confidence, and Thunderwriting. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> you think about the proprietary tech, there's all the business model stuff, uh, which is one thing, but at its core, Kin is a tech company. 
And one piece of proprietary tech that we've written is this policy admin system. This is like the guts of an insurance company. So legacy insurance company either is running off of sort of this mainframe system that could be 30, 40 years old, or they're using something like a guide wire Duck Creek is off the shelf. It's not proprietary. It's not really advantaged. So that's one thing is our PaaS, our policy admin system is super cutting edge. It's built exactly for what we need. It gives us a ton of advantages. And then the other thing is what you're asking about, which is this data infrastructure. And so we have a few different systems within that. And really the point of this data infrastructure is that we're the best at understanding the physical properties of a home, especially relative to its geography. So what Maestro does is it makes it really easy to plug in and out new data sources. And this could be a, an API. It could be something we're scraping off of a site. So for example, building permits, right? They're, they're public records, you can scrape them. They're all different, they're hard to interpret. <laughs> it's all unstructured data. Uh, it could be a database where we're like downloading something and self-hosting it, making it searchable. Um, and, and so that's Maestro, it makes it easy to plug in and out new data sources. Then we have Kinbot. And if you walk into an insurance company or an insurance agency, what you'll see is the, the, there are a lot of people sort of reading documents. And what we've done is we've actually uh, replaced those people with an OCR uh, layer. So uh, think about something like a home inspection or like a picture of the roof of the home or a picture of the side of the home. These things are all getting sent into the can bot, which is taking all the unstructured data there and extracting it into structured data, uh, replacing the people. I mean, we've seen some, some, some insurance companies try to replace the customer service aspect with the bot. And I would say, no, like people like talking to people, but replacing back office stuff with a bot, that is a no brainer. And that's what the can bot does. And then the third thing is confidence. Because, which is, and we just love these kin puns. So you'll see them all over the place. Uh, we're just a bunch of nerds. And uh, what Kinfidence does is it's not all just about the amount of data you have. And we have a lot. It's about understanding which data sources to trust when and where and how to weight them against each other and understand when you're sure, right? So what Kinfidence is doing is it's taking all of the data in and it's telling us for one facet of the home, let's say the roof, let's say the roof shape, for example, it's gonna tell us what it thinks the roof shape is. And it's also gonna tell us what the likelihood of it being right is for that roof shape. So maybe it has three different data points that all agree about roof shape. Now it's, it's gonna spit out, okay, this is pretty high confidence, high confidence. Maybe two of them agree and one is off by a ton. And now it's gonna tell you something different. And so this is a, it's a, it's a model that's telling us both of those things, it's really useful. And then the last one is thunderwriting, which is our take on underwriting. And um, sometimes you do need a human to look at something. Maybe the result is really ambiguous. Maybe confidence spit out, we have no idea. <laughs> like all the data sources disagree, we don't know what to do. Um, and so the legacy way of the legacy insurance way of doing that is you send the whole insurance file to an underwriter. And that's really expensive, it's really slow. And what we do is we've actually created um, we'll take just the field we're uncertain about and then all the supporting data. And we'll send that to this other app, which is the Thunderwriting app. And we have an offshore team actually, who are just data verification experts. And so like, for example, there are a couple of guys in India that work for Ken that spend all day classifying shingles. Well, guess what? They're really good at classifying shingles. And actually they're, they're pretty fast, right? So you're getting a response back that's very similar to the response time you'd get from an API. And, and that's really important because then we can process more customers all the way through without intervention. But what's really cool about this is Thunderwriting actually then creates the training data set that we use to train all the automated tools, right? So for any sort of AI problem, you're going to need the input values and you need a training data set. And, and this is where we get our training data set from. Interesting. So I have a friend that works in artificial intelligence. So some of the concepts you mentioned that are familiar. So are these all bots, you know, are they all using some sort of machine learning, artificial intelligence and learning continuously with the PDF and the data that's fed them? Yes. Yeah. There's a lot of ML. I mean, some, some of this is heuristics, you know, some of it is, but, but a lot of it is ML uh, and AI. Okay. Super useful tool, especially when you're dealing with these huge, huge data sets. 
Okay, no, that's very impressive. You know, you guys are definitely ahead of the game over there. Uh, I'm going to come back to you with a question regarding moats, uh, Sean. But Matt, I wanted to ask you a question first. Can you elaborate on the key transaction highlights? What is the closing value as of now? How big is the pipe? How much yep. closing will you uh, providing to Ken? Great. And I refer everybody to the investor presentation, obviously. Um, but the enterprise value would be $1.03 billion. Uh, they'll emerge from the transaction with $80 million pipe that was led by some great firms like Hudson Structured, Senator, uh, partners from Related also came in. Uh, and as a result, uh, net proceeds between trust, which is $207 million, $80 million pipe, net of fees, about $240 million. So significant amount of money to fund growth uh, for years to come. So there'll be enough cash to uh, support Ken for the first couple of years at least. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah, through profitability. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Sean, I wanted to ask you a quick question. How do you, um, do you guys have a moat? Like, why can't the legacy in, uh, insurance company recreate these bots, you know, and just do themselves as well tomorrow? Yeah, like, so legacy companies have a really hard time doing this. Um, it's actually easier to do a startup and compete with us at this point. And I'll explain why. So for the legacy guys, they have, they have two really big problems that stops them from starting on the journey that we started on five years ago. And the first is their core systems do not support this. So I talked about our policy admin system before. The legacy insurance companies are all running on these other like very antique uh, systems. So if they want to start using a modern system and doing all this data analysis and stuff, they actually need to do a replatforming first. And that's really that's a really big project. I used I used to be a management consultant. Lucas, uh, my co-founder, used to work at Accenture. We've done these. They're so hard. It's actually so much harder than starting with a blank sheet of paper. And they usually take like if you're really dedicated to it, if you put hundreds of millions of dollars against it, you could do it in five years. Uh, that's you know very optimistic. So that's one. You have to fix your tech, and then because all of these legacy insurance companies rely on the agent to input the data, they actually allow the agent to change the data. They rely on the uh, user input data versus the, the machine data. They actually need to sort of cut off the value proposition of the agent. The agents hate that. So now you actually have to completely re redo your channel. And that's really hard for them because they actually have to eat their own lunch to do that, right? So if the agents learn <laughs> that you're starting to go direct to consumer, they get pissed off. And they leave and keep in mind that most of these agents are representing like 10 or more carriers. So they can switch your business off like that. So these big insurance companies are terrified of it. So if you, if you do the platform shift, if you completely change your channel, <laughs> then you can start on this journey of figuring out which of these new data sources are predictive of claims, which is ultimately what you're trying to predict. Uh, by, that, by the point that happens, we've already been at this five years. So let's say that one of these big incumbents does get their act together and start doing this. They're five to 10 years away from starting to compete with us. At this point, we have a 10 year plus head start. Uh, and the most important part of the moat is what I was just saying, which is the relationship between all of these new sort of data points that are all programmatic and the likelihood of the customer becoming a customer and the likelihood of the customer making a claim. If you understand that full relationship, you're in, you're in a really good position because you can figure out exactly who to market to. You can figure out exactly how to price the product uh, to make sure that you're pricing it appropriately for their risk. And that's, that's the secret sauce is proprietary and really, really hard to copy it actually takes, you know, you get better at this over time, right? Cause the model is fed with more and more data. Uh, and and that's, that's, that's really what we're building here. And we think it'll be extremely defensible over time. What I find fascinating too, it's not quite a moat, but uh, it's really hard to achieve. When I first started interacting with Sean, you know, you wonder what's who's your average uh, customer, what's their average age? Because I see a ton of DTC businesses, and of course, they skew younger to early adopters. But then it becomes a problem as you look to scale. You spend more money to go wider, harder to acquire. The average age of a kin customer is 57 years old, and a lot of those customers are being are taking advantage of the fact that you can either go straight through the process of onboarding digitally, or you can pick up a phone and talk to a kin agent, which is kind of what you need in this you know, hybrid world. And it's showing up in the net promoter score of 85 when the industry is sort of stuck in the 40s. So those aren't moats per se, but I think they're evidence of product market fit and that the world wants, or at least the country wants insurance to be sold this way. 
hundred percent for sure. Post COVID world, you know, direct to customer is the way to go. You know, and I can clearly see the moat. It's similar to Tesla. You know, they're five to ten years ahead of the nearest electric vehicle maker. And even though a company in China can break it down to components, it'll still take them seven to ten years to catch up to the same position you guys are in currently. Right. It's not to pick on Verizon, but why does a Verizon store look so different from an Apple store? You know, it's just kind of like it's just not easy to do when somebody sort of figures out a different way of doing things. You know, some of the biggest mistakes I've made in business are when I think, oh, we could just do that too. Well, but you're 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 sort of discounting how hard that thing is to do. And I think that's what DTC homeowners insurance is. For sure, for sure. The next question, this is directed to, towards Matt. You a little bit talked about the board of directors that you have. Can you elaborate a little bit more on specifically what they bring to the table for Ken and how, how did you find this particular board of directors and what makes you think they're the ones that can uh, leverage Ken to the best possible you know, customer base and growth into the future? Okay, great, great question. Um, so I actually encourage everybody uh, later on, when we're done, take a look at a study that McKinsey put out uh, last, I think, October. It was, it was trying to dissect, are there differences between uh, performance of SPAC cohorts, trying to figure out, is there a certain segment of SPACs that outperform? And what they identified is there is, it's operator-led SPACs. And they found, you know, the statistics roughly are operator-led SPACs outperform other SPACs by something like 40%. And there's a couple of other academic studies that have now verified this general operator premium. So first things first, when looking at the group that I put together at Omni, there's a strong bias towards operators, people who've been there done that, you know, so I have uh, my group of advisors, Scott Tannen, who created a company called Bowl and Branch. Scott understands customer acquisition and how to go DTC. I won't go through all the competencies, but what, what the group collectively stands for are the areas that I see are either the areas where DTC struggle as they hit an inflection point and try to scale or where there's opportunity to sort of amplify, right? So brand is a good example. Emma Shine is the founder of Gin Lane and Gin Lane has done a ton of different DTCs over the last you know, five, six years. The, the aesthetic, the brand, he's on my board of directors. You know, Scott Tannen understands customer acquisition and what's the latest going on. Gary Vaynerchuk oversees, you know, 900 people who all day long are doing customer acquisition and marketing on behalf of other digitally fueled brands. By virtue of having this group, I can now in real time pull in all that expertise and then redirect it towards Ken. And it, it's happening already. I mean, no exaggeration. Sean and I are talking constantly. We, uh, you know, they needed a CMO. I helped them saw, source a CMO, Victor Lee, that I went to Gary Vaynerchuk and he recommended like, it's happening in real time, but that's what operators do. I mean, operators see an opportunity and they jump in, they see a problem, they attack it. And so I put together this group pre premised on the idea that operators led SPACs will uh, outperform. And also the idea that operators have a bias towards staying with things post-merger, post-announcement, post-transaction. And that's going to be my approach to Ken, heavily involved and in making sure that I'm supporting Sean in whatever way uh, he needs it. I would definitely love to go over that paper, you know, if you can forward to us. Uh, yeah, I'll send it to you. I'll send you actually, there's been, so there's been three, there was a master's thesis that came out about three weeks ago, forgetting the, sorry, young man, wherever you are out there, thank you for studying to me, but uh, that basically validated it. And there's been another paper by Wolf, but that found similar, uh, a, a, a cohort of SPACs led by operators that outperform not just, uh, at least the McKinsey found this, not just other SPACs, but actually the S&P sector. So that's what I tried to replicate, but I didn't replicate it because of the study. I replicated it because it's my DNA. I spend my day all day, my time with founders and, I, and operators. And what I like about them is they have a bias towards run toward the problem and just figure it out. And that's the approach that Sean and I have been taking throughout this process together ever since we met, you know, first time we had our conversation in February. And Matt, there's nothing wrong with evidence. Evidence proves itself, right? If operators are the way to go in the- Well, that's what I'm saying. You, I always believe, you can appreciate this as a doctor and a scientist, put yourself in a cohort if you can, right? Like if you could put yourself within a cohort, which is this cohort, which is already in my DNA. Another thing that the study found when their hierarchy of reasons as to why they outperform, one of them was the ability to source great deal flow without relying on a bank doing you know, a SPAC off and at this, the ability to diligence Right. Like in the process that I've been going under uh, with Sean, we've relied on a ton of experts and people that I've been able to pull directly to figure out, you know, uh, what about the CAC? Where are opportunities to expand channels? All the different areas that I might need that expertise. And then thirdly, they found that operators tend to stick uh, with the 
with the uh, transaction to target uh, longer term from a governance standpoint, which obviously helps de-risk the overall transaction. For sure. Thanks, Matt. As soon as I get it, we'll dissect it online. I'll send, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Sean, this is a question for you. Let's say I'm a, I'm a home, homeowner, you know, I'm looking for a home insurance plan. How would I even come across Kin Insurance? Like, how would I even know that they exist? That's question part one. And part two, can you explain to me the whole process from A to Z of what I'll be going through? Yeah. So starting with the first part, a lot of our customers come to us via word of mouth. Uh, actually, there's a really funny story uh, from last week where one of our uh, one of our one of our VC investors posted on Facebook about about the SPAC announcement, and his mom responded in the Facebook thing. She's like, "Oh, actually, we're Kin customers. I didn't know that was a business that you had backed." And his mom, by the way, is like an 80 year old Indian woman, and he was like. That's so weird. How did you not know that? Like, I didn't tell you about Kin. How did you find out about them? And she was like, oh, we're in this really tight knit Indian community. And your dad's friend told us just to call Kin. And, and this happens all the time. It's because our customers love us. It's about 20% of our customers come to us that way. So we do that. And then the other thing that we do is we're really good because we have all of this data we're really good at specifically targeting the customers that we're a good match for, ones that are likely to convert, ones that match our underwriting criteria, ones that we have a good price for, ones that we think will have a good loss ratio, ones that we think fit sort of from a risk management perspective. We don't want to have too many customers in one place, for example. And we're specifically targeting those customers using an algorithm. So we're bidding on that traffic online. We're sending direct mail. Um, we have a bunch of traffic partnerships, you know, companies like Bankrate, for example, where we're getting traffic from them. And it's just like, it's sort of like a math problem. And because we have so much data, we're, we're really good at winning this. The other thing that it, a lot of people don't realize about insurance is because home insurance is all sold through these agents, we're actually not competing against other insurance companies. We're competing against these guys, these agents in the strip mall. And they're good at a lot of things, but they're not good at like programmatic marketing. They don't have enough data. They don't have the expertise. They don't have the scale to do it well. And so we just sort of run circles around them online. And so, you know, if you look online at our reviews, you'll see like, why did people choose Kin? They'll say, oh, it was a good price. It was easy to get. The customer service was really good. But what they're not telling you is that Kin targeted them specifically because we knew mm -hmm. they were likely to become a customer. That's a big part of what we do. Okay. Um, Part of the strategy with Sean is to wear the Ken shirt every single day I've ever met. I've seen him since the first day I met him. So it's pretty remarkable, along with everybody at Ken. Right, Sean? Uh, we're very, very into our branding. We've got Ken umbrellas, Ken shirt. We've got this really cool yellow Ken sunglasses. I'm going to get a sweet Ken tattoo on my back when this all closes. It's, it's Ori awesome. Orientation at Ken's called Kindergarten, as you might imagine. So it's... <laughs> it's, we live and breathe it, man. We, we're so proud of what we've done. Um, and, and the answer to the second part of your question, what happens? Uh, so you enter your address and it, we ask you a few more clarifying questions. Uh, we may ask you to upload a document or something like that, like a picture of you know, home inspection or something. And then you get some choices and we bundled it up into packages that we try to make simple. And then you can sort of modify those packages. Now about 15% of our customers go all the way through. They know exactly what they want. And they are really confident that it's like, boom, 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 boom. But the other 85%, they get stuck. And they're like, ah, I think these are the right coverages, but I'm not sure. And like, you know, it's a new house. I don't, I don't know that much. Or, you know, should I have a million dollars of liability insurance or should I only have 500,000? I don't know. I want to talk to someone about it. And those guys, they'll email us or text us or call us or we'll call them. And, and, and they have a conversation with us. And we, we guide them through. And that's why you'll see people actually in our reviews referring to the Kin CSR that they talk to. Uh, and, and that's a big part of it. Um, after that's done, we're going to ask you to go around your house with your phone and take some pictures of the stuff inside the house that we don't have good data on. So a good example of that would be the plumbing under your sink. I want to know what kind of pipes you have. I want to see a picture of your electrical panel. I want to see a picture of your water heater. And there's there's a bunch of things. And that that sort of app, the the self-inspection criteria is going to change based upon the risk profile of the home. So we're going to ask different people different questions depending on what we already know. 
and then that's it. Then you then you have insurance, and you know it's people. Some people do it in ten minutes. You know, it, it can't be very easy. So you can go in ten minutes from A to Z, from you know starting your application to getting a quote to closing yeah. a quote. One hundred percent. If if you can. Now that's not the path most customers take, right? Like most customers start the process when they're starting. They might they might get ten quotes, right? Because they're shopping for ten different homes and they want to see, well, what is this one going to cost? Then they settle on the home a week later. They make an offer. They get it accepted. They go back in. They resume the quote. They realize they have a question about it. But so it usually is a more convoluted path. But if you know exactly what you want and you're ready to buy right now, yeah, you can do it in ten minutes. You probably do it in three minutes. Okay. Well, that's awesome. You know, we just bought our home about about a year ago, and and going through the same questions. You know, five hundred thousand versus a million, and just kind of googling around and looking at Reddit and what other people were doing. These are valid questions people have, and and you know the point you mentioned earlier, like uh, people asking their friends where to get insurance. That's how everybody. Well, that's how our circle does it of doctors, right? We just ask who to go with and so forth. So that definitely really matters for sure. Now, transition to one, one of the last questions. Why Kin? You know, there's like 300 spots out there. Why OCA and Kin? Um, yeah, so I was, I was looking for something that could fill, like we're always looking in, in our investors, we want people who can help with the business. Like there's mo- like there's so much money out there, right? You can get money from anybody, and we have some really really good fintech investors. You know that's in our DNA, right? I had a fintech company before this. We have Hudson Structured, who are like they're not that well known, but they're like the best insurance investors. And in this, we are really looking for somebody who could help us with the marketing side of things, who could help us with the brand building side of things, and. Matt found us and he, he came over. He'll tell you this story too. And I was like, whoa, you're amazing at consumer marketing. You have this incredible team around you. You're super well-connected and well-known in this state that Florida, which is a huge market for us, was our first market. Like, this is amazing. And, you know, we, we did talk to a bunch of other SPACs because of course, you know, they were all, we were on their radar too. And they wanted to talk to us. Um, but this one, it just felt right, uh, and and it's been fun so far. You know, they're they're really really helpful guys. Uh, Matt's really helpful. It's it's cool. And I think from my vantage point, we launched this back in November with a you know very specific thesis laid out in our S one about digitally fueled business uh, within that range of valuation where we landed, uh, disrupting a change resistant industry. DTC was one of the categories we would look at specifically a mission driven business with a mission driven founder with a great management team, you know, and, and, uh, but I think the best decisions are relative decisions. So obviously I looked at a ton. And then, uh, when I met Sean, I just felt like Kin checked all those boxes, but that's the beginning of the inquiry, right? There's then a ton of work. And we had this first phone call and I said, you know, I really like it, but I need to look you in the eye before we even get going. You know, if I come to the office, you know, we'll, we'll, can we meet? And he's like, yeah, sure. I was like, no, I mean like tomorrow morning. I like, all right, as I'll be there at nine. And then we, and that was the beginning of our journey. And we worked really hard together to understand the business and to, and to, you know, do the work uh, and tap into the expertise. But to Sean's point, I think it is actually a perfect marriage. I think when SPACs are done right, you have a sponsor team that really is filling gaps and amplifying opportunities that maybe the company on its own couldn't necessarily take advantage of, or that it would be a lot easier to do. You know, Gary Vaynerchuk is a huge personality. You know, he's running a big firm. It's kind of hard to get his attention. And yet Sean and I have had multiple meetings with Gary and Emma Shine and Bobby Brown, you know, it's like, these are just great people who want to do great work and want this to be an incredible, you know, outcome. And Sean, this is one of my criteria, you know, it's more, a little more nebulous, but you want people who are seeking out uh, change and awareness. You want people who are fundamentally intellectually curious, especially in a founder, so that they can avail themselves to whatever it is they need. And right away, Sean has demonstrated like a lack of ego and saying, okay, we could use help here. Yeah, we haven't actually amped up our brand, our brand as much. If people have heard Lemonade more than they've heard of Kin, that's gonna change over time. But like, I sure would love some support. And that's been our dynamic ever since. And my approach to business is servant leadership you know, what can I do for you, Sean? Put me to work today. Like, I'm not here to be on a board. I'm here I'm here to go to work. I'm also here to be on a board, but I'm here to go to work. And that's been our dynamic ever since. And it's been great. We've been at it for several months now and it's just been nonstop. 
That's awesome. Well, it definitely looks like you guys have a great working relationship with good spirits and great ideas. Uh, we really wish you the best of success at RSPAX, and we're going to transition to the second part of this conversation and go online for the AMA, few AMA questions we have. We really appreciate your time, Sean, and we know you're super busy. Same for you, Matt. Um, and uh, just send us that paper. <laughs> We'd love to well. dissect it online. Uh, and uh, best of luck on uh, closing your transaction. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.